and to pay my respects to elders and to the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who joined us here today. And sovereignty was never ceded and we're sitting on stolen land, always was and always will be Aboriginal. I also wanted to introduce Wintana today. So she's our program curator and panel facilitator. Wintana is an African Australian podcaster, presenter, and the co-creator of Bittersweet Podcast. She's recently joined Trump as our special programs curator, and in such a short time, she's come up with this amazing program, um, a fantastic talk series, and she's joined today by her guests Sabrina McKenna, Star Torres, and Marion Hussey. Let's pass over to you. Thank you. Trying to do is I'm trying to understand, and it's good understanding where we're able to respond 
um, to make it happen. And so before I kind of got into community and, and the people beside me have been in community for longer than I have, I just, I really just started. Um, but that photo series for me represents um, this idea of union um, and this idea of coming together uh, for an aligned objective, which is what I'm trying to achieve. And I do that through the support and the voices of the people that I meet on the street. Um, so yeah, I think I kind of held it on up, but yeah, that is what I do. Thank you. <laughs> you can hold it on up, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm Sabina, and I, as um, Lutella was saying, I have a project called Learning From. I also have a background in journalism and writing, and that's kind of where I entered the art world. Um, from speaking to lots of queries of colour and um, colour and work about identity, it led me to want to explore that and like, take our stories into a gallery setting. So I started Learning From about three years ago, and it was kind of about a personal exploration of my own experience when you that question. Um, you would probably all agree that it's a frustrating thing that we encounter a lot and it has this way of splitting your sense of identity into many or two different ways and it takes away your own kind of definition of that. So I really wanted to ask local people, um, particularly Australians of colour, what their experience was of that and um, yeah, so I chose to use photos and stories similar to your project. Um, and we do collaborations and um, exhibitions like we did one on hair recently and one with a million, so kind of a creative all around the world in that sense. Hello, I'm Sky. Um, some of you might be familiar to the day. I am a proud man and kind of a little bit of a woman. Um, so before I continue, I also like to acknowledge that we are a small of nations and um, paying my respects to its elders past and emerging along with the other indigenous people that we have here, along with all the other beautiful people that we have here today. Um, like as I said, when you were a DJ, before that I was a bit of a nightlife personality, kind of being somebody who was around all the time. Um, I would say I'm an all-round creative as well. I like to kind of take my shoes into a bit of everything, but I would say that element of that is um, community, um, like you said, you know, a lot of people consider me to be an activist of some sort, so I'm pretty vocal where I want to be, and that's only coming from the history of people in my family who have been, and the community as well, that have been very active in being very vocal about the things that we deserve as human beings. I personally would not call myself an activist just because in the sort of spectrum of social media these days, anybody can have that sort of title to himself and have that just be, whereas I believe that my title is more of a community member because you know, I don't think you are a part of the community and you genuinely care about everybody and that you will be somebody who actively works towards the people who are a part of that. Um, but yeah, I think I'm a bit different than you can try to do something that's directly um, like a project or whatever, but like I said, I try to take part in doing that kind of thing to, towards my community. It's how I bring them together all of them to my basic platform and I kind of to work towards that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
regardless of color, because I believe color is a construct. I just recognize um, that I'm defined as black, and I'm defined as black woman, mm -hmm. and I live in a Western developing world in which it doesn't accept that in a lot of different ways. But if you want to really break it down, I think that everyone has potential for it, to do whatever it is that they need to do. They just need the support. Um, so I say to people that the, the difference between me and the homeless person on the street is that I have a family that supports a business to me. I have the same demons, I have the same philosophies, I have the same education as them, the same passion as them, the same, the same intelligence as them. I'm no different. Um, so when you talk about what's missing, I don't think anything's missing. I think it's all there. I think it's about aligning things together, which is what I realized only through my photo series. That um, I have to speak to someone on the street like, whoa, that was really smart. What university did you do? Like, what? You know, and I would meet someone else and be like, whoa, you really helped me figure out something about myself I didn't even know I needed help with, you know? And then these strangers, which by virtue of my photo series have become my family, um, taught me so many things. And the most important thing that they taught me was that they had everything. Um, and that it's not what they're missing. There are certain people that I don't see that, A, yeah. but B, that if we're talking about black people specifically in this country, that we need to come together and recognize ourselves, right? Because I believe that true change comes from women. I don't think I'm going to change anyone's life because I'm really, I'm a stranger trying to figure out my own life. I'm trying to retire early, you know? So at the end of the day, I guess my thinking when it comes to people is that they've got everything. They just need to see themselves and see each other and when you see each other then you don't have to call you don't have to answer my calls you don't have to say hi to me on the street if you hold yourself accountable and you're circling around you accountable then your job is done that's what i think and i think nothing's missing it's about recognizing everything that we have to gain And so I was always kind of thrust into the deep end, I guess. 
in sort of getting myself out there and exploring the world more. And while doing that, like you are, um, you know, you find that you're the only black person in those spaces, or mostly the only colored person that people met in that time. I see myself as kind of like living by example that you know you can go out and be in these spaces and do that. You can go and pursue these different types of hobbies and interests because you know just because we are only shown to be artists or football players or you know got like in prison doesn't mean that that has to be the story that was of yours. Um, so yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting my. Like, Halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of weaved into my next question. I feel like you answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, but I wanted to talk about the, your personal experiences breaking into the industry that you're in, or even just connecting with people in the space that you connect with people in, like white spaces, and how like, the challenges you face. Because I know for myself, like going in, sometimes you feel like there's a lack of experience, you know, there's this whole thing that when you see something, you, when you see yourself in a position, you believe that you can get there. And when you don't, sometimes it feels really intimidating or you feel, you question whether or not you belong there. So for me, I think that a lot of the times I have struggled with knowing the right people to get into places or even just, like I said, fitting in. So can you guys talk to us a little bit about, I guess, your experiences and how that kind of panned out for you? I've got a perfect experience to show you. Yeah, that was a perfect one. So um, I, once I graduated from university, um, I did a journalism degree at RIT, and um, at the time I was working for Vice. And Vice was everything that I wanted, because I was just crazy and wacky, and I loved going to parties, and I loved people, and I loved doing things that didn't make any sense. Um, and they said, same, same. And it was like a whole buffet, you know, like a never ending this huge buffet. And I was like, where I want to be, you know? But essentially at the time I realized that my um, actual journalistic skills um, was so poor. Uh, and um, just quite frankly, like, you know, I wouldn't actually technically write an article. I couldn't, I couldn't take a photo that was deemed correct. You know, I just was going off my limb what I thought was right. Um, and then I took a job for Fairfax and, and they had accepted. And I moved to regional New South Wales, um, which was uh, in between the city and, and, and um, Canberra Road. Um, but I, I went to Goldman and I remember telling my mates about it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to Goldman. Um, and I'm like, watch out for the white people, Mario, watch out. And I'm like, okay, yeah, all right, I'll try it. Like, you know, I can run fast, you know, I don't know if that means anything. Um, so yeah, I remember, I never forget um, walking into, because I ended up staying there for two years, uh, working in journalism all around that region. And there was no one that looked like me. Um, there was, I had no connection to my blackness. Um, you know, I remember one guy at work said to me, um, hey, Mary, I, I saw you at the gym yesterday, and I, if, if anyone knows me, I don't go to the gym, I will um, bless the genetics. But essentially, I was like, nah, it wasn't me. And he was like, nah, yeah, she looked black, you know, like, mate, there's no one that looks like me. <laughs> and that was the joke, and I just walked away, because that was the truth, like, it was some other black person. <laughs> um, and it just wasn't me. Um, so essentially, it was then I realized a lot of different things. It was then I realized that going back to my earlier point, color is so much in so much that every individual chooses to be who they are in a certain moment. It doesn't matter if you're black, it doesn't matter if you're white. In fact, if you're being completely honest and this is my truth, my personal opinion, there's a lot of black people sitting on black people and white people in general, in my opinion, right? That's just what I personally think. And that's why I'm saying, let's talk together, let's understand each other, let's work towards a unified goal before we ask for the white structure or a white system to do something for us, let's get our shit together a bit. Yeah. Um, but essentially when I was involved in what I realized was that color was a construct. And the love and the family and the acceptance was really there, even though I had thought they were so separate to me. Yeah. And they would never understand me. Um, but when I realized that we had so many things in common, um, and I realized in that moment that it's an individual white but in, in, in the setting of a work environment, I've always been, you know, the youngest person um, in a newsroom or in an office, um, always the only black person. 
Um, for that, I, I do um, corporate communications at Andrew Australia. I worked as a media officer there, and I was the black person for at least five levels. So essentially, I've always, I guess, running the back of it. As someone who's been born black in this country, yeah. I've always been born and trained to be outcasted. Yeah. So for me, without trying to not answer the question, it's just what I would call old news. Old news in so much that, like, you know, it's not like, you know, it's as a black person in this country, like, it is what it is. Like, you're always outcasted, you're always being like, you're all undervalued, they don't, they don't think that you've got as many ideas as the next person, like I said, it's not everyone. And no one's always going to be saying that to you, but sometimes it's just a feeling. Um, my strategy, which has always been my strategy, because, you know, you deal with it in school, you deal with it when you start dating people, you deal with it when you're in social settings, and then you unfortunately have to deal with it in a professional setting where you think you're protected, because you get paid to come in. So you think that there's some kind of protection. Um, but how I deal with it is how I deal with any other scenario, which is I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, if I sat down and addressed every ignorant person, goodness, would my life be gone? You know what I mean? Like, I, I actually don't have enough time because I think time is valuable to address that. So what I do is I just keep my same energy and hope that, you know, that person has come out of misinformation, the wrong education, ignorance, upbringing, culture, and that's not a justification, but I say, you know what, they're human, it is what it is, I gotta keep it moving, because this is a professional setting, and, I'm, and I've got a clear purpose, and I'm trying to get somewhere, so I'm not gonna lower myself down, what I call bending my back. Bending my back for you, because there's no point. You're a stranger, I work with you, I'm not paid to be your friend. At the end of the day, if it escalates to a situation, yeah, sure, let's bring in HR, bring in HR, you know? But at this point, as a black person in this country, in my personal opinion, we've always been outcasted. So why is it any different when you're at work? You know, so that's, that's, that's just my thinking. And I probably have a, I know I sound pessimistic in this, in this note, but I'm actually, I actually think that I'm like quite an optimistic person so much where I say, well, they're just human, and I know the best structures that I'm trying to set up. The black image, the black family, the black future. Um, but let me deal with it one person at a time. Let me deal with the structure one conversation at a time. And let me be an example of a mature person, an understanding person, a fair person. And let me not be like my own person. You know, let me not be like someone I don't want to be. And I can only do that through my actions, you know? Yeah. I can only do that by keeping my same energy, consulting with my people, consulting with my past, and the history of my ancestors, and everything that they've sacrificed for me to be here, taking a whole deep breath, going for a walk around the park, coming right back and saying, hey, what's up everyone? How's it going, you know? Because, because you know, that's just, the, that's just the story. And that's not me saying, oh, I'm the boy and I want to be defeated. Or I'm going to take these words. It's just recognizing that I can't change the whole system in one conversation. That's not, that's not how I think it works.
the, the credibility is like affirmed in that way. But yeah, it's really interesting having a look at some of the things that my other friends have got, you know, like creative and the amount of work that they produce and the caliber of the things that they do compared to the next person who maybe is like way more recognized in the industry. Yeah. And like, yeah, I think. Is that because they're not being of color? Or is it yeah. Like yeah, white like people who do some things are so yeah. have done as much, or maybe even less than us, and just the recognition they get compared to the, what they get. Yeah. And um, I mean, people will often remark about how much I do with one of the different kind of like classes I work. Yeah. And they're so like, how do you have the energy? But I'm like, I've always had to have that energy in order to compete, I guess, in the roles yeah. I want to be in. Yeah. So yeah, I think being an example is really important. And as much as there are power structures existing that work against you and to undermine you, undermine you, you can still do the things you want to do and do successfully. Yeah. It, it, it might just be a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you please give a question a bit? <laughs>
decided that we can start creating our own opportunities. Yeah. Where it was like, you know, I think we've been told for so long that we need people to help us. You know, like we need to get these handouts, we need to get given these opportunities, and we thank the board and then it's like, one, we deserve those same opportunities just as much. Two, it's, you know, you kind of don't need you in the first place. You know, we thought that we did because we needed venues, we needed space, we needed equipment, we needed, you know, sponsorships, and it was us some people were like, you know, like, I can write those letters to get sponsorships, and I can write those emails, and you know, I can talk to venues, and we can organize our own spaces where, you know, I don't have to wait to be put onto this whole lineup of white DJs to get my, you know, my 30 minutes of opportunity and then feel like I'm going to be paid or treated with the respect that I should be at that time. So I think we've been very lucky to kind of live in the age that we do where, you know, because there are so many of us that are deciding that, not even deciding, but to realizing that we, we deserve to be here and we get to be here and this space is for us to occupy, that we really make all these moves where it's, we're putting on our own festivals and our own shows and our own parties and we're starting up our own labels, making our own music, we don't feel like white producers anymore to get this time in the studio for an hour, we can buy our own equipment, we can buy our own programs, we can do all this on our own. So I think it's that sort of, yeah, the realization that we have everything that we need. Yeah. And it's kind of pushing out that idea that we aren't just this little speck of whatever that it's only expected to do these type of roles and these type of jobs and follow these pathways when it's, you know, because that's what it is at the end of the day. It's people telling us that we can't do it, so that's the expectation of putting it ourselves because, you know, somebody keeps telling you that you're worthless through generation upon generation upon generation saying that this is what you're worth, then you're going to start believing after a while. That unlearning process as well, through that, you know, not everything we've been told lie, but it's been told to keep us down and you know, we're not meant to be out there. We're supposed to be up. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
and they want to be represented as a South American, you know what I mean, as a Vietnamese, as a Greek, whatever you want to name it. You know, so it's just, it's just, it's, it's even, even if you don't think I'm some, you know, even if you don't know, agree, it's just this idea of representation is what is actually happening. Yeah. You know, and I think it's important that everyone gets what everyone wants to get. Yeah. Um, I think representation is important to me because I want to give a big example of what other young women of color could be. I think, um, I guess, my career path has been uh, like forged by the things I was interested in, not necessarily the things I had access to, and I've always been an advocate for just giving things go, whatever they um, appear to be for you or not. And I think that's the biggest thing as well with where you're from is like by having these conversations and being frank and open and honest about these everyday encounters with racism that we have and um, marginalization, it just gives people the opportunity to tap into those own, their own experiences and the challenges that they may be facing that they can't actually see for what they are. So I think, yeah sharing the stories and having, I guess, not being ashamed of that and opening up the space for that conversation was really important. Um, and also showing people that you can do anything you want. And like, yeah, I'll be not well who's white, right who's white, but like, I do it. So, <laughs> simple, but yeah. <laughs> Outside of our kind of 
like the safety barrier or all the outpost code, doing stuff in the city or going to do stuff in the state or jumping on the civil service to be like started to the same schools as us, you know. She went to the same youth group, we did everything together and she had all the same opportunities handed to her. I can do that as well. So yeah. yeah. But um, even just what you said at the end, Sky, that, you know, if you pick your story or we're going to pick it for you, and I think there's this issue of always being a single narrative of how we are, and it's always been pushed out, how we're supposed to be, how we are, and I think that representation, even if it's just a mental shift, is so important because when you can just change your mindset of who you are, eventually a thought can manifest into something bigger, so, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's critical. But I'm going to go and just ask some of your single questions, and I'm going to start with these guys. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I noticed through your work, the work that you do, your online persona, is how you always weave in politics into your work. Um, and it might not be intentionally or, you know, but um, your platform doesn't only showcase your craft, but it also shows that you're a huge activist for the Indigenous community in Australia, and you'll be able to provide resources and, and education to challenge people's bias, which I think really important and, a huge, and it plays a huge role in how we perceive the indigenous people. Um, and yeah, so what has been your experience taking on this role and why do you feel a sense of responsibility to, I guess, switch your, yeah, your online persona and, and, and yeah, that kind of way? I think for me, it's always been about In my opinion, I see just me being alive, you know, existing in the world that I am as being political. You know, this country tried to essentially erase us. They tried to ensure that we didn't get education, that we, you know, were bred out in some form, we couldn't get jobs, etc. And for me to be alive is that's the strong lineage that I come from, the community that I live amongst and be able to carry out my passions and you know, do whatever I seem to fit with myself is a really important because there were specific systems out there that were put in place to ensure that I was able to make a task work. Um, so I've always kind of seen myself as that. Um, I come from a very like a very staunch family of women who have always been fighters, I guess. The idea of, you know, we've essentially been living in existence of a resistance. Um, I see a lot of my this idea of like 
oh, you know, I've been bullied by the like, black kids at school or whatever. And it's like, oh, well, you know, and like, you know, they can be mean to you or whatever. It's like, well, that's missing the point. You're doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. You're not doing the right thing to get the right response, I guess. You're not doing it because you really want to be given a treat. At the end, you're doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I've always had to be that person that, in the you know removal of the sugar, I guess like I used to, I used to be the person that used to like go out to the clubs and then, like if I heard something or saw something in the club, I'd go fight them and like smokers and have nothing with them. Um, I was a regular on the bar and smokers doing that a lot, and I had to be like the Tommy one day, you know, like why do you do that? Like like they're drunk, like they like people who usually keep those fights with you, they're. They're not doing it because they're going to change their mind in any aspect at all. And I'm, I told them, you know, I'm not fighting them at all. I'm not going to change their minds. But I've got a, I've got a crowd around like 20, 30 people that are listening to this conversation that have their ears in, you know, they might be pretending to talk to their friends or whatever, but there's drama in the corner. They're going to, like, they're going to want to know what's going on. They're going to be hearing what I say, you know, and even if that changes one person's opinion, or maybe that's even change it. before, you know, like, then we have all these little fighters, so I've got that energy in with me. But I think I've been a bit forefront with that as well. I feel like, you know, doing all of this takes a lot out of you. It's not that physical sense, that mental, it's that spiritual sense as well. That I think what I am kind of a bit proud of in the kind of community that I have in that online that I've got. Sorry. Um, is that I realize that people are taking what I'm saying and being like, you know, there is a lot of labor in asking for equal treatment, for asking for fairness, for humanity, and that, you know, it's the same, it's like, you know, you can't fight with the oppressor without being oppressed. There, like, nothing's really going to change. You have to have those people who are in those positions to be wanting to make those waves. And I have seen over time because one of the things that I do do online is I do um, sort of like reflective time of being like, okay, so like we're having a break of me yelling at you and throwing stuff at you. What have you changed in your everyday behavior and thinking that has happened over time while being here that's going to get you to, you know, make some actual changes in the spaces that you are that I'm not in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you often don't have that conversation as well, like what happens after all this work. Yeah. Like, can I just say? Yeah. yeah. Like with um, the online movement last year with Black Lives Matter, I feel like there's a sense of like, I talked about this recently in a podcast, but there's a sense of completion that I'm feeling that I don't, I really don't like, and I didn't like it at the time when yeah. people were so like, Firmly, like, we've got to talk about this issue. Yeah. Like, and we're all sitting here being like, okay, we've been talking about this for how many years and we care now. Like, we care until now. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's really important that we're doing that because, like, the conversation has to continue and we do have to check in and actually take metric, you know, measure the KPIs. Because, yeah. yeah, otherwise, we can talk forever and if there's no one listening or doing anything, it's not really, yeah. That idea of, like, this is not a sprint.
also is that I'm the only person who definitely didn't be. And the other ones, I think it's so important for us to have that sense of community and that sense of connection with our people because, you know, we don't really come together when it's for the right, not, not, not that it's not for the right reasons, but maybe if it's not for like, you know, in terms of a like career or just to better ourselves or even just to know the people in our community and what they're doing. I think to network with each other is how, it's very, it's just so important. So I wanted to ask, as a community member, can you talk to us about what you're hoping to achieve by recreating positive, authentic imagery and connecting black people? Um, I hope that people watch, so African Kings is an independent mini series um, that is hopefully going to come out in the middle of this year, but I recognize that in, in my community that black men struggle to talk about themselves. They're not present physically or they're not present mentally, right? Um, and I realize that as a result of that, um, people have lost really key pieces of information that contribute to their understanding their work and their sense of self. So what I decided to do is get 10 black men, um, not just from the continent, African-American, um, Afro-Brazilian, um, twins, twin babies that were raised in France as well. So different types of black men to sit down and speak about what it means to be a man, what does masculinity mean, what does love mean, what does your family mean? When you have those kids with that white woman and you're like, ah, I don't really like her anymore. What does that mean, you know? Um, and I want us to have a frank discussion about what it means to be a black man. I want to put these episodes together, and it's not just for the service of social media, because I don't, social media, I don't want to start talking about this, I'll start ranting, but essentially it's not, it's not for YouTube or it's not for Instagram, it's, it's, a prim, it's primarily an education purpose. So I work at a jail, um, and essentially I want that to go to um, jails so that young boys of color um, can see it. I want it to go to schools, um, where there are predominantly black people so that teachers can use this as a resource to have conversations about what it means to be black if they are unable to have that conversation within their community. Because I feel like in every in every group there's there's two stories. There's a there's a story of the privilege and a story of the poor. Now everyone picks a side, whether they know it or they don't. And for me I'm gonna try to understand those that are in the supply plane, which is for the sake of this conversation the poor. The people that don't have safe phones, the people that never have two parents, the people that don't have money in their account, the people that have no phones, the people that have one pair of shoes, the people that are always taking the bus. Those are the people I want to try to understand. Those are the people that I want to try to help. But I recognize that I was privileged, that I was raised in a different setting, that I didn't have those same experiences. And I'm grateful for it, but I also recognize that I'm disconnected to it. But what I'm starting to realize by talking to people and trying to understand people is that when it comes to African men or black men, however you want to put it, um, there isn't a transparent dialogue, and that's really detrimental to the world that we so, so, so the series is supposed to just um, invite people to have a discussion, which I think is the best way of going about everything in this world. Having a discussion that's honest, uh, where you're honest with yourself, but you're honest with the person beside you. And essentially, it's a way for people, I'm hoping that, you know, obviously, I'm hoping people will have conversations about it, but they can look to themselves and say, oh, I, now I can hold my uncle accountable. Now I can hold my father accountable. Now I can hold my son accountable. Now I can hold my neighbor accountable. Now I can hold myself accountable. And then from that, do whatever you want. Because I don't, like I said before, I think change comes from within. And, and I don't think I, I can say anything or anyone else external from yourself can say anything to change how you see this world. It might assist you. You know, imagine a black and white photo and it's expensive color, you know? And essentially, only you can fill out that color in that image. You know, no one else can say this one thing and it is all going to become color. It is only yourself that can come up with those understandings. So I hope that it just, it starts a discussion. It starts a discussion so that people can be honest with themselves and be honest with others. Because the only two things that help guide me in this crazy, crazy space for the community it is practicality and positivity. Everything that I do, anything that I go to, I always ask one, just one thing, is it practical? As in, am I just talking or does someone get anything? Do you keep it? Like what's, what you were talking about before, how, what's the metric of understanding? 
what's the measure of your success? It's definitely not social media, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Oh, that's not personal for It's definitely not social media. It's definitely not resharing tag. It's it, for me, it's just not it. I feel like I've been forced to be on social media and I recognize that our platform we are we are. I can't wait until I've made it and I smash every technology device that I've ever heard. And honestly, if you want to ask me, like, man, what do you want to do when you've made it? Bro, I never want to touch a telephone again. That's it. I want my assistant to hold my telephone at all times because I just don't. It's not the way I like to communicate and I see it as being the product of unhealthy, inconsistent, and undesirable behaviors. So in terms of what helps, what helps guide me is practicality and positivity. And I hope that this show provides a space for that conversation where we can practically start doing things. Because you know what black people love to do? Black people love to talk. Let's meet in the corner of every party and talk to And if you gave me this microphone, I would just keep on talking, you know? But at the end of the day, at some point, you need to stop talking and you need to start doing something about it. You know what I mean? Because your words are empty. My words are empty. I don't want to say anything and not back it up with action. And I hope that this series is an example for me because I want people to take that and to take ownership of that and to have their own conversations. Not for me to have their own con those conversations, or for them to come to an event that I'm hosting to have that conversation, but for them to take ownership. Because when you take ownership of something, then you take courage and responsibility, and then you become that leader in that space. Because that's what I believe, I believe everyone has the opportunity. Everyone has the potential to be any one of us sitting on the couch. Like, it's just, it's, it's, you know, this is my personal opinion, I think. With the right support, with the right understanding of yourself, you can get to wherever it is that you need to be in your life. But if it's not backed up with practicality, then it's just empty words. That's what I think. It's empty words. Thank you. 
um, is a problem that I'm working on. Um, but I essentially recognize that it's kind of good to have self doubt because you don't want to always think that you can't be touched, that everything that you do is perfect, you know, and everything that you're saying is correct. I think self doubt is an example at times of people recognizing their humility and space in this world. You know? And I think it's all right for us sometimes to um, embrace that and to learn something to do. Um, and I don't, I don't have a lot of people following me, or a lot of people view my stuff and check out my Instagram and jack that number up. But essentially, um, it's not even a lot you know, that I'm freaking out for. I guess is what I'm trying to make in this example. It's, um, it's just this idea that I'm sharing a part of myself that I haven't before, and I just don't know how this is going to be perceived. And I just have really bad trust issues, so I just assume that what everyone says to me is a lie. You know? So at the end of the day, for me, at the beginning, I just, yeah, you really just post something or share something and just go all the way until the next day and be like, you know what, let me just separate myself from this because in, in the context of social media specifically, we have all these um, unrealistic metrics. How many people are following you? How many people are viewing your videos or photos? How many people are sharing your content? I really break this down because I used to work with social media advisor. And there are so many things. But essentially, I don't believe in any of that in so much that social media is a product. When they created Facebook, when they created Instagram, they said we wanted to replicate face to face communication online everywhere. It was about accessibility of communication. So, like, it wasn't that we had a problem speaking to each other, it's that we had a problem speaking to each other and they just wanted to capitalize and make it a whole lot more. So, for me, as someone that tries to really avoid social media, I just say that's an unfair metric. I want to subscribe to that. I recognize it as a platform and I, and I move on because if the people really see it, sorry, let me start, let me go back a bit. If you're genuine in your intentions or your creating, then it will be received well. Even if you get one like, one follower, one share. That's, that's what I think. And I think that <laughs> if, if that is such, a, that's actually really, really tough to actually. Um, to remember for a few things. A, because there's behavioral um, patterns that, they are, that they're normalizing in our social media use. So when you're expected, you're just used to the way that you are, you just, you know, you're just like that. Um, if we already see certain things at certain times, it makes us feel as happy. But you know, studies show that a lot of health issues are more um, a lot of depressed, have a higher chance of experiencing mental health issues all because of social media. We know the statistics that we're doing in other generations, people that are under the are going to be more anxious, going to be more depressed, going to be more likely to experience mental health. They really know this. Right? So at the end of the day, it's because of how we're using social media. And essentially that self-doubt can do all this on social media. So I guess in the context of understanding that our work has to be shared online, what I say to myself is if I have the right intention and I'm saying it in a way that's fair, then we're going to A face-to-face conversation is a whole it's a whole different situation, but from my it is what it is. And if you're if you're sharing it public, publicly, like you know, you've got a or you've got a show coming on television or whatever, I think you have that same thought process as well. And I think you say that if people aren't responding to it, you say that they're not the people I want. Which is what I said to myself when I started this. Because I was like, yeah, I'm going to like it, yeah, like it's going to be shit and stuff that I'm running. I was just like sitting on 500 dollars for a minute. And I was like, damn, look at um, but essentially what I realized was, hey, man, you know what? Um, the people that are responding to you, the people that are messaging you, the people that are holding you accountable and telling you about things that you don't even remember, those are the people you want around you. I think the social media, like we've been saying, is just an echo chamber of lies. It's a metric. It's an algorithm. And I don't want to start saying about that, but it's an algorithm. So essentially, we recognize without intentions of pure. Sure, they might be self doubt and you know, skirting on our feet. If that intentions are pure, then, then everything I think will be alright. You know, you shouldn't just focus too much on the numbers and how it's going to be something that's where it's self doubt and stuff. It's like, well, who is going to support that? Like, if you know it's yourself, I'll pass on to stuff. You just reminded me of something when you talked about self doubt and all that being like, like basis of fear or something. Um, you know, I had somebody tell me something really, really good. Like re-imaging the 
Are you like stopping here as being fearful of something that you're doing, but you know, realizing that you know you're doing something great, like courageous and that you're gonna be taking a leap with something, especially when it's hard, you know, like your whether it's just a funny artwork or your sense of installation, you know, whatever, you're giving a piece of yourself and it's very vulnerable and it's very personal. So, you know, if you're having that self-doubt, it's that worry and then putting out a piece of yourself out there that helps them do these things. So it's, you know, rethinking about how you can show up fear. It's, maybe it's not fear. It's the fact that you're about to do something great. So, Thank you. Thank you.